Hey everyone, I'm Case Aiken, and this is a first for my Superman analog video series, because I actually wrote the thread that is serving as the basis for this week's episode today, because it's a character who, when I started the series, wasn't on my radar to talk about necessarily. But then the dawn of X, relaunch of the X-Men line, changed the status quo for this character dramatically. So back in January of 2019, when I wrote the thread on Captain Britain, I was talking about Brian Braddock, who fits the bill pretty well. But since then, someone else took on the mantle. His sister, Betsy, formerly Psylocke of the X-Men, but now she is Captain Britain. Now, the Captain Britain core is really complicated, and I talked a lot about it last time, so here's a link to that video, because I'm probably not going to go over that today. And look, I definitely will not be able to go anywhere near as in-depth as Connor Goldsmith does on the Cerebro podcast, so if you like the character, I would recommend you go check out that show. He did a profile on Betsy as the first episode with current Excalibur writer Teeny Howard, and they went into wonderful detail and have way more complicated thoughts than I I will ever attempt to convey. So if you want a real deep dive, go check that out. So Betsy Braddock, twin sister of Brian, was originally introduced in the early days of Captain Britain to be a plot device. She was used as a bystander, a pawn, or a damsel to be saved often. That is to say, when her precognitive powers weren't cluing our hero into some coming danger. At first, these powers weren't directly explained since the franchise was on the periphery of the Marvel Universe. But when Chris Claremont brought her over to the X-Men, her unexplained innate psychic powers were explained to be mutant powers. And this is the point that tied the two franchises together, perhaps inextricably. Now, I will admit that the lens I view the character through is as a kid who got into comics in the 90s. So a lot of information came by me reading up on a character I liked rather than the status quo I was reading at the time. Because Betsy was a very different character in the 90s and remained that way until now. Yeah, so for more casual X-Men fans wondering how Captain Britain ties into that cool ninja running around from the games and movies, it's complicated. Betsy Braddock has had different powers, skills, hair colors, and even bodies. She has been through a lot. Back in the Captain Britain days, she was reintroduced after Brian's power up in Otherworld as a model slash spy. This is where her iconic purple hair first popped up, a dye job, and her early precognitive powers had evolved into telepathy. She even had a run as Captain Britain for a bit, a detail that I used to dream about bringing back if I ever got to write for Marvel. But now that particular ship has sailed. This was not a particularly good time for the character too. An evil alternate reality version of her brother tried to rape her, and a duel against the villain Slaymaster left her blind forcing her to use her telepathy to compensate. But she made it over to the X-Men where she filled the late 80s spot for a bitchy telepathic head bitch in charge. This is an era that I need to read more of, so apologies for not really having more to say about this time. But if you're wondering how a blind British noble cloaked and wearing armor became a ninja? Well, that's a good question because it is weird. So originally it was supposed to be a single storyline where Betsy was transformed by the hand into an Asian woman and brainwashed to be an assassin for the Mandarin. But the artist at the time was Jim Lee and he drew an amazing design for the character that prompted Claremont to stretch that storyline out a little bit. It was after all a weird form of representation that the X-Men was lacking, but in retrospect, it feels like Yellowface. The thing is, this was about the time Claremont was ousted from the X-Books. So whatever plans he had to revert the character to a posh British model slash assassin were dropped and the character would be more or less in this form for the next 30 years. Fabian Niciesa came on to pick up the pieces and decided to retcon the story as a body swap rather than a mystical plastic surgery job. He introduced an assassin named Conan whose body Betsy's mind was now inhabiting and Betsy's body was inhabited by Conan's mind. But let's be clear, this was a retcon. Originally, the story had Betsy transformed into this new form, which is why people could recognize her face. Anyway, when Kanon first popped up, she was a bit confused. She had memories as Betsy. Likewise, Betsy had all these martial arts skills that she had never possessed before. Kanon claimed that she must be the original Betsy. It, however, was more complicated. The long and short of it is that the sorceress slash interdimensional TV producer, Spiral, was the one who actually did the body swap. And because she just loves the drama, because think of the ratings, she mingled the two minds together in the process. As a result, both share a portion of the other's mind. Later, presumably to simplify things, the powers that be decided to kill off Conan, leaving Betsy in the wrong body. See, for reasons, this new look for Psylocke was quite popular. And I'm not gonna lie, this is the first instance I can recall being into a comic book character, so I know that I was both the target demo and ultimately part of the problem. Now, 90s X-Men had a number of characters whose bodies had been changed beyond their original forms. Betsy ended up pairing off with Warren Worthington III, formerly Angel, but transformed into the blue-skinned murder cyborg Archangel. 
I thought their bond was actually rather sweet, and the relationship was very nice. While it lasted, that is. And this is about as good a time as any to mention that Betsy had a bit of a rivalry with Sabretooth, going back to her original self. When it was time for their rematch in the 90s, Sabretooth had been going through a bit of a fake-out redemption arc, following his heroic turn in the Age of Apocalypse storyline. When he revealed himself to still be a warped sadist, Betsy confronted him to protect Boom Boom, who had been taking care of him while he was recovering from a fight with Wolverine. When facing off against Betsy, Sabretooth revealed an immunity to psychic attacks thanks to the brain damage caused by Wolverine's claws piercing his skull, and so he was able to ignore Betsy's offensive powers, and so was able to mortally wound her. Warren saved her by tying her to the Crimson Dawn. This left her marked with an eye tattoo and gave her shadow teleporting powers. And this just so happens to be about the time they made the Capcom X-Men fighting game, which would spawn a popular series of Marvel-based fighting games. And Betsy was featured in that game with teleporting powers and a psychic knife, which I can't believe that I haven't mentioned yet, considering it became her iconic power in the 90s. And I can't emphasize enough just how influential those games were to popularizing the character. Seriously, the reach of video game fandom is so much wider than comics. It's how the character became as widely known as she had ever been. And while it's not the first time Betsy had been adapted, she had been on the 90s X-Men cartoon after all, that was only as a supporting character who was also using the 90s Asian style design. So it's no surprise that this was the version of Betsy that was the basis for Olivia Munn's portrayal in X-Men Apocalypse, without even an attempt to explain the body switching. Actually, there was generally a move to de-emphasize the body switching aspect of the character. Other versions in the comics also shied away from addressing the body swap. Betsy Braddock in Ultimate X-Men was never identified as explicitly Asian and was presented as British. So maybe she's of mixed race? We met Brian much later, and I don't know if they ever drew a connection between the two. When Claremont came back, her powers changed yet again to telekinesis. Supposedly, this was because her telepathy was holding the Shadow King imprisoned, while a fragment of the Phoenix Force empowered her with telekinesis, I think. And this is the time where her signature psychic plate now became a physical weapon by way of her telekinesis. Shortly after, she was taken out of action in the pages of Extreme X-Men with a case of death? I was not checking out the X-Books that much in this era, but I was reading Exiles, so I was initially happy to see the 616 version of Betsy show up there, but I had no idea she had recently come back from the dead, nor do I now fully understand how. Also, remember that grudge with Sabretooth? Well, the team was being led by the good Age of Apocalypse version of Sabretooth, which on a meta level addresses the root of how Betsy was even in a position to be wounded by him. She obviously didn't react all that well to first seeing him. Fortunately, the two came to a truce. Eventually, they became became somewhat flirtatious co-workers. During this period, the immensely powerful telekinetic Psylocke was the resident flying brick on the Exiles. Alongside a version of Gambit that was the son of Namor and Sue Storm for some reason. I'm sorry, I have mentioned that Exiles might be one of my favorite books that Marvel ever put out, but the Chris Claremont run on that series was not one of the better ones. It's still worth checking out just to see how it goes, and there are some very creative ideas and good, deep-cut callbacks, but Claremont had a new roster in mind and shuffled out the existing one a little too quickly for my tastes. Now, considering that Claremont was writing a book about multiverse heroes, you'd think there would have been more appearances by the Captain Britain Corps. But there was a crossover that sort of concluded the initial run of the book called Die by the Sword. When she got back to 616, or 616 for you Cerebro fans, she ended up on X-Force, which had become a Wetworks team by that point, where she had a relationship with Phantom X. And that relationship with Phantom X continued when the Phantom X that she loved became a girl. Then, shortly before the 2019 Dawn of X reboot, the Mystery and Madripoor story arc occurred, where Betsy's original body was reformed and she and Kanon were able to reclaim their original forms. Entering the Dawn of X, Betsy ceded the Psylocke name to Kanon and was kind of just crashing on her brother's couch while going through an existential crisis of identity. But then Brian was captured by Morgan Le Fay, and Betsy took up the role of Captain Britain to rescue him. Betsy has the Amulet of Life now, bequeathing the powers of Captain Britain, mystical energies augmenting her physical form, drawn by the friction of the very multiverse. Plus, she has both her telekinetic and telepathic power sets. She is a knight in mystic armor with a telekinetic sword and shield. And y'all, this is almost exactly the concept I had for a greatest Captain Britain, Betsy with all of her powers. The only thing missing these days is her precognition, and while I wish I could have been the one to write it, Teeny Howard is doing better than I ever could. Betsy assembled a new Excalibur, saved her brother, installing him as Captain Avalon, and saved our world from an invasion through Otherworld by the lost mutants of Arako. Ultimately, she's the person who brought the current galactic era of mutantdom into fruition. And like, go read Ten of Swords. I mean, 
read Excalibur leading up to it too, but Ten of Swords is so good. It's all up on Marvel Unlimited. With Betsy truly owning the role, the Captain Britain Corps has warped to reflect her, and we are left with a Captain Britain who is a champion of the multiverse and link between magic and mutantdom. She represents Otherworld, Krakoa, and Britain, a complicated hero for all. With the Captain Britain powers, she's super strong and nigh invulnerable, and that's further augmented by her massive telekinetic abilities and formidable telepathic ones. Much like Megan, she's not an Omega-level mutant, but her mix of magical and mutant powers makes her pretty close. With her martial arts skills still floating around somewhere in there, she's as skilled in combat as she is powerful. Betsy is left one of the mightiest characters in the Marvel world, and an easy stand-in for Superman on any team. Hell, with the stealthy Psylocke in contrast to the powerful Captain Britain, Betsy and Kanon make for quite the world's finest. Or they would if they weren't extremely uncomfortable being around one another for completely understandable reasons. So that's Elizabeth Betsy Braddock, Captain Britain, formerly Psylocke, absolute queen. Next time, I'm going to be picking up where I left off in the series of Superman analog videos with another patriotic captain. But until then, stay super, man. And here's where I mention all the YouTube stuff. Make sure you like and subscribe and also check out certainpov.com where you can find the podcast that goes along with this and a ton of great stuff. So check that all out.